Let's start it off with some prayer. Father, we're just here for you. Lord, we're here to worship you. We're here to praise you. We're here to sit in your presence. We're here to hear from you. Lord God, we just want to honor you and give you all the glory. And Holy Spirit, I pray that we just not be a church that just receives the word, Lord God, but I pray that uh, through your power, through your teaching, through your conviction, Lord, that we are a church that lives it out. Father God, that we don't just have information, but we have transformation. Not for just our sake, Lord God, but for the sake of those in this community so that they can see who you are, the good God that you are. So I pray you have your way with this message. In Jesus' name, amen. So I just want to start off with a question and ask the question. You can raise your hand. You don't have to raise your hand. But if I were to ask the question, how many of you guys are actually content with where you're at in life right now? How many of you guys would say you are? Content with where we're at in life. Uh, Daniel Cordero wrote an article last year where him and his uh, research team had been traveling around the world for five years straight, going to remote areas to unreached people groups And it took about five years, like I said, but he was on his trip to the Himalayas in the eastern part of Bhutan. And their whole goal is just to end this research project. And what they wanted to see is in the human being world, no matter where you're at, how many people can recognize the human emotions that we have. And so they were going to unreached people group, which to me is like, man, you're crazy for even doing that (laughs) because they don't know civilization. You're going into their territory, which oftentimes isn't, end well, but with their guide, they would go and and present emotions such as joy, peace, sadness, any type of emotion that you can think of, they would present it to these people. And to get to the Eastern Bhutan, he he went and explained, I kind of felt like I was listening to my grandpa when he would explain his school days back in the day where they had to walk up both sides of the hill in the snow, never canceling school. Uh, That's what he explained. He said, man, we had to go up a a mountain, down a mountain, up a mountain, down a mountain, through a river to reach this this group of people. And they get there, and they start presenting these emotions. And to his surprise, every emotion that they listed off or showed these these people, they, they responded. They almost knew all of the emotions. And it shocked him. For an unreached people group to know every emotion, uh, it was, it was surprising to him, but then they came upon the word contentment. And before they could even show what contentment may look like in a human being, their guide, uh, Dr., uh, I don't even know how to say his name, to be honest. It was Wanji something. Uh, but he stops him and says, hey, I, I got to tell you something. The words you're about to show them is one of the highest um, values that we can have in our culture. Like joy and peace and sadness, like we know all those, but when you're about to come to contentment, I want you to know that this is very special to our people. He says, it is the highest achievement of human well-being. And in our culture, it is what the greatest, it is what the greatest enlightened masters have taught us for thousands of years. And what they deemed as contentment in their culture was that right here, right now, in this very instant, regardless of what you're experiencing, is perfectness. And it shocked Daniel. And I read that story and I thought about how right now, for my wife and I, contentment is something that we're trying to teach our daughters. Because contentment is something that we learn as human beings. It's not something you just possess. You gotta learn how to be content. And so we're trying to teach them at a young age. And honestly, part of the reason why I have the, the, the lights down so much is because I don't want to see, have you guys see how much gray hair I have been having come in. Maybe from leading here, but more so because I'm trying to teach my daughters things that's becoming very hard for me. Contentment, we would go to a store, and I, I kid you not, for Zoe and Gabby, as soon as we walk in the store, their eyes get big, and the first thing to say is, can we go buy a toy? Yeah, yeah. My reaction is, no, we're not here to buy a toy. We're here to go shopping for the basic needs. So we go from, can we buy a toy, to as we're walking, 
Hey, mom and dad, can we get some food? For those of you who are parents, you know what that means. That means candy. <laughs> and it's, no, we're not here for candy. So where we're walking by just aisles in Walmart and everything Zoe sees, like Gabby picks up on it first. If you tell Gabby no twice, she's like, I'm done. This is a boring game. I'm over. But Zoe will just keep pushing your limits. So it's no to toys. It's no to candy. Man, mom, look at those clothes right there. Can I buy some clothes? No. How about electronics? No. How about a new book? No. Nope. Like by the time we leave Walmart, I promise you that Zoe's in the state of if you just buy me some cleaning stuff so I can clean the bathroom, I'll be happy. <laughs> like it is a full on training day in and day out for our daughters to teach them about contentment. And here's something that was the most fascinating thing to me about this, this research that Daniel put on. No matter where they went in the world, this is crazy. Every unreached people group that they reached in the five years that they did this research, every single one of them revered contentment as the highest estate that they could cultivate in their life. Everywhere they went, in the foreign countries, contentment was the greatest thing that they taught their people. But here's what their research found also. What they found in the Western civilization was that we don't pursue contentment, we pursue happiness. And church, I gotta tell you, there's a difference between contentment and happiness. Because if I were to go to Michael and say, hey Michael, you want $1,000? First of all, some of y'all are gonna get mad that I picked Michael, but he's probably gonna say yes. Because who doesn't want $1,000? Especially when it's cash, no taxes on that. You give him $1,000 and he may be happy for a while. But at some point, that $1,000 runs out and there's no happiness. So what they found in the Western civilization is we are pursuing happiness, but the, 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 the sad part about pursuing happiness is that in America, in the Western civilization, is that depression is rising at rapid rates. Anxiety is out of the roof. Stress is just crippling People And in his research, he found a vast difference between the unreached people group and how they were content with what they had versus the Western civilization where it wasn't enough. Contentment. In church this morning, I'm excited because maybe there's some of us here today that struggle with being content with what we have. And maybe there's some of you who are just really good at being content. But I always believe that we can always have more, amen? Amen. That's what I love about Dave Ramsey. If you want to learn about contentment, just do the Dave Ramsey program because he makes you pay with everything with cash and you get up to their cash register and it's like, man, I don't want to see these dollar bills leave my hand. I'm content with what I have. But Paul talks about to finish up Philippians, this view of contentment. So if you have your Bibles, if you open up to Philippians 4, we're going to end it today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're done with Philippians. All right. We're going to pick up in verse 10 in Philippians 4. Paul says, I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I've learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Man, verse 13, I can do all things who strengthen, uh, through him who strengthens me. I can go to the NBA. <laughs> I can go to the NFL. I can make a million dollars a year. It's through him who strengthens me. Context is key, amen? And I, reading this passage, the first thing that stood out to me, guys, was this, is that uh, when we talk about contentment, contentment doesn't come from what's going on around us. It's, it comes from who's inside of us. If we want to learn about contentment, if we want to be a, a people of being 
satisfied with what we have. We have to realize that it's not about what's going on around us. It's about who's inside of us that, that does that. And I'm, I'm sure that many of us here know that when the times get rough in our lives, when we go through the trials, what's really on the inside comes out. Right? Perfect example, Friday with Nebraska football. We all knew that they were going to lose. It was just going to take one bad play and the block punt happened and then it was all over. I'm still mad. Is Roger here? Praise the Lord. <laughs> he did call me yesterday, though, and I said, Roger, I don't want to hear it. And he just laughed. But what's inside of us when the going gets tough, what's inside of us is going to come out. And there's a story of a man who is sitting in Chicago's airport, Chicago Airfield. And there's an immense, dense fog that, that really pushed their flight back. And this man just happened to be a pastor. And so he's like, well, I have two things I can do. I can sit in my chair and just kind of people watch, which is what I would have done. Or I can get out a book and learn more about God. I'm going to get out the Bible. So he pulls out the Bible and he goes on to explain that as the, their flight kept getting pushed back, there was a man who began to pace. Have you guys ever saw the, the pacers? Like you're on your phone, you're just constantly like this. Just like, yeah, yeah, that's cool, man. That's really cool. Sweet. Like you're a pacer. This man that's with him starts to pace. And, and the pastor explains that as he starts pacing, he starts to use colorful language. And he goes on to explain that that colorful language made it even more dense in the airport. But for some reason, that man saw this pastor and he saw the Bible in his hand. And he said, how can you be so calm knowing that our flight has been delayed this many hours? And the pastor says, it's not me, it's the one who's in me. And he's able to share the gospel with him. And I want us to know, church, that contentment is not complacency. Like there's some of us in this room right now that believe that uh, we're content, but really it has been wrapped in a disguise of complacency. And really what happens when we become complacent, we remove the blessings of God in our lives. Because God has called us to so much more, but we've been, rather than content, we became complacent with what we've been doing. But contentment is not complacency. And here's something else that contentment's not. Contentment is not a false sense of peace. Contentment is not even an escape from the battle. What contentment is, it's in an all-consuming peace and confidence that while we're going through the battle, we can be at peace. And Paul's explaining this. See, in verse 11, we see the word learned, where Paul says, Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. He goes on to say, I know how to be brought low and I know how to be abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret. I want you guys to know that those two words learned are actually not even the same words. They're not even the same words. Learning a secret brings, it, it, in, in the latter part of the learn, it means he, it came to fruition. But in, in verse 11, when he's talking about learn, it means I have gone through experiences in my life that has taught me how to be content with what I have. What does that mean? Well, it's not necessarily fun for us as believers. What Paul is getting at is, hey, I've lived the life of a Pharisee. I've had everything. Money, food, power, authority, teaching the law. I had everything. But Jesus came to me, and I encountered him, and I've lost everything, but I've gained everything. I've lost all the money. I've lost the privilege of having food. I've lost the power and the authority of controlling people, but I've gained a relationship with Jesus Christ. And he goes on to explain in 2 Corinthians, I'm gonna to flip to there real fast. 2 Corinthians 11. I should have just typed it on my notepad, huh? It's all right. Well, So he goes on in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 23. I want you guys to, to know what Paul is saying here. He says, are they servants of Christ? Are they really servants of Christ? I'm a better one. I'm talking like a madman. 
with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings and often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes, less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, dangers from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from the Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And apart from other things, there is a daily pressure of me, of my anxiety for all of my churches, who is weak and I am not weak, who is made to fall and I am not indignant. What Paul is saying is that, hey, this contentment that I've had, this contentment that I have right now, it, it wasn't just given to me by Jesus Christ when I placed my faith in him. This contentment that I have, the reason that I can sit where I'm at right now is because I am content in my relationship with Jesus Christ. I know what it's like to hunger. I know what it's like to thirst. I know what it's like to have food. I know what it's like to have water. I know what it's like to have money. I know what it's like to have no money. But in the midst of all that, because of what I've experienced with my relationship with Jesus Christ, because I've endured persecution, because I've had to face oppression, because not everything was easy in my life, I have gained this valuable, uh, essential need in my life of contentment. And I just want to show us what Paul is talking about. If you could put that picture up there, Ava, that'd be great of the prison. I want you guys to see what Paul's living in right now. This is Paul's current circumstance when you see the underground sewer with those makeshift aluminum looking people. This is a prison in Rome. Now mind you, Paul had his own, so he wasn't grouped with everyone else, but they literally lower you through that circle hole where you would be sitting there with other people. Hardly any food, hardly any money, hardly any visitors. It was brutal. It was cold. It was wet and damp. It was something that I wouldn't want to live in. But Paul, if you read Acts, was given his own. He was able to supply his own need because of generous gifts from other churches. And what Paul is saying, that no matter what battle I'm going through, no matter what I'm facing right now, I am content because of Jesus Christ who is in my heart. And it's, it's fascinating, church, because he's talking about something here. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. To get a full understanding of what Paul is talking about this. There was a thing called stoic religion back then. And what they believed in was this. You can be content, Cindy, because of what you do. Jenny, you can have contentment because you can just tighten your own belt and get through it yourself. Whatever you're going through, you can get through it because of who you are. It was this religion of you do it yourself. And so Paul's talking to this church in Philippi, which is around Rome. So they got this religion of, and, and he flips it on and says, but I can do all things through him who strengthens me. What Paul is deliberately saying is, hey, I'm going through struggles. I'm going through a trial. I'm going through hardships, but I can't do it on my own. Rather, I can do it because of the one who's inside of me, who strengthens me to do it. See, there's a thing called self-sufficiency. Does that ring a bell for us? I don't need to run to the Father because I can do it myself. I don't need to seek God in prayer because I am a person that can handle it myself. I don't need to run to my brothers and sisters in Christ and ask for prayer because I can do it all by myself. It's called self-sufficiency. And rather than having self-sufficiency, what Paul had was Christ's sufficiency. Paul knew that in order to maintain a right mindset while he was in prison, that he had to rely on Jesus every hour of the day. Church, as believers, I want to encourage you guys as believers, if you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ and you are pursuing him in a relationship and you are longing to have a touch from him, if you've done that, as believers, we have the power within us to face every trial in our life. It's not a matter of having the power within us. The only thing that's holding us back is us releasing that power through faith. 
If you place your faith in Jesus Christ, church, hallelujah, praise the Lord, you have the very Holy Spirit within you. You have the power that you need to go through the trials of this life. The only thing that's holding back that power from being huge in your life and, and showing it around you is us releasing it through the word of faith. I want to encourage you guys, that if you're struggling this morning, if you're struggling this morning, because of Jesus Christ being in your life, you can face hunger. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. That means when I'm hungering, I can get through it because of Jesus. When I have an abundance of needs, I can get through it because of Jesus. When I'm having a hardship, I can get through it because of Jesus. When my marriage is failing, I can get through it because of Jesus. When I don't know how to teach contentment to my kids, I can do it because of Jesus. When I'm tired and weary of living my faith out on uh, day in and day out, we can do it because of Jesus. Church, it's not self-sufficiency, it's Christ's sufficiency. It doesn't matter what's around us, it's a matter of who's within us that's gonna allow us to be content. And I wanna encourage you guys today, it's gonna be the same thing pretty much. If you're struggling this morning, the only thing I can tell you is get into God's word. And some of you guys are probably thinking, do you actually believe that, Pastor JJ? Do you actually believe that if I get into God's word that I'll become content? With every fiber in my inner being, I believe that. Because when we get into God's word, the Holy Spirit begins to fill us up day in and day out with his wisdom and with his knowledge and with his words that allows us to be content. This is the way I explain it. I think I told Jenny this morning at worship practice, I never realized why I was going through CPR training. 2017, Midland College, RHD, I had to go through CPR training. I thought it was the dumbest thing I've ever had to do. I'm sitting there behind the table with a mannequin, a half mannequin that you see on the office, and you're giving CPR to them. It was super hard to even make their lungs fill up, but you had to do this, right? And I'm thinking, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? I never got it until last night. God knew what my wife and I was gonna face. And in 2017, God prepared the way for me to be able to do the Heimlich maneuver for my daughter in 2021. Five years go by before I had to use the CPR training to help save a life. And what I'm telling you guys is there's times where you get into God's word and you're saying, I don't know what I'm reading. I don't understand what I'm reading. I don't even know why I'm reading this, but there's times when you do that, that's gonna fill you up because down the road, you're gonna come back to that verse. You're gonna come back to that time that you're reading the scripture and it's gonna sustain you in Christ's sufficiency to get through the trials that you're going through to today. God's word. We got to get into it. And Paul knew in order to get through that prison, in order to go through the underground sewer, in order to get through this trial, he had to rely on Jesus Christ and not his own self-sufficiency. And the one way he did that is by knowing the word. And he goes on to say, yet it was kind of you to share my trouble and and you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into a partnership with me in giving and receiving except only you. How would you feel about that? As a church planter, you've planted all these churches and now the churches are like, oh, you're on your own. Thanks for starting my church, but you need to go that way. Uh, we see what you're doing missionally, but we're gonna use it for ourselves. Not one church wanted to enter in with him, only the church of Philippi. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases your credit. I have received full payment and more. I'm well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. In, in church, this is a tough one, but I just gotta say, contentment doesn't come from financial stability, it comes from financial generosity. It, it's a hard one, it's, it's, it's very hard, but it does not come from financial stability. It comes from financial generosity. Because the church in Philippi, they believed in what Paul was doing. Paul planted a church that radically transformed the lives of those in Philippi. There are people in the church of Philippi who did not know the Lord. 
But when Paul came and planted that church, they began to evangelize outside the wall and began to see fruit from the evangelism. They began to see people come to know who Jesus Christ and radically changing their lives. They believed in what Paul was doing. But here's the thing about the church of Philippi. Church, we gotta understand this because they're a small church. Maybe at tops, most scholars believe, 80 some people. They're a broke church. They come from an area where they don't have very much money. But here's what they realized. They they realized that they weren't blessed to bless themselves. They were blessed to bless others. They realized that the blessings that when God provided for them, it wasn't so that they can indulge in themselves. It wasn't so that they can build this massive 401k or Roth, or whatever they're called in for the financial terms. It's not necessary just for that, and those things aren't bad, but what they saw was the need for the gospel to go forth to change people's lives because they knew that every single person had a time when they were gonna stand before a just, sovereign God, and they knew that when they stood before God, there's no way to get out of a righteous judgment. And so the church of Philippi said, hey, Paul, we know that because of the mission that you're living, because you're declaring the gospel, like in Romans it says, how will they know unless if we go and declare the word of God? Because you're doing that, we are going to sacrificially give, even though we don't have a lot of money, even though we don't have a lot of materials, we are still going to give and bless you because we want to be a blessing to you and not a blessing to ourselves. Contentment comes not from storing all of the money, guys. It it comes when you give back to God. It's amazing what happens. In in Mark 12, 41 through 44, the widow's offering. It says, and he sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. So sitting there studying how people are putting back and giving back to God. Many rich people came in with large sums, right? They're given large amounts of money because they're rich. Check this out. A poor widow came, put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. Jesus called his disciples to him and said to them, truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance. Key word, abundance. But she, out of her poverty, out of her poverty, out of having nothing, put in everything she had and all that she had to live on. Financial generosity. You have two groups of people in that, in that passage. The rich, who are giving their 10%, which is great. That's what God calls us to do. But then you have a poor widow who's like, man, I don't have very much. And what I do have I'm about to give it all into you, Lord. Financial generosity. It brings contentment. But church, I want you guys to know that when we give financially, when we give lavishly, when we give back to God what he's called us to give and then some, I promise you what's on the back end of that is gonna be amazing. And I want to also promise you something else, that when we give generously to God, that did you know that he views it as a sweet aroma? Did you guys know that when you offer a sacrifice, like this widow in, Matthew, or in Mark 12, when you offer the sacrifice of saying, this is all I have, God, but I know that you're calling me to give it to you. Man, the missionaries on the wall, Lord God, I don't know how much you want to give. By, well, maybe I do know now, but that's a lot of money each month. That's me sacrificing. When you sacrifice in a way that God's called you to sacrifice, did you know that it offers a sweet aroma to him? But I want you to know that it's not just a sweet aroma that that pleases him. God isn't impressed with us just going through the motions. When we come up with our tithes and offerings, he's not impressed with us just coming up and just, here you go. What God's impressed with is when we give generously with a spirit of faith and thanksgiving. And contentment doesn't come, church, from storing everything into our own cupboards. Contentment doesn't come from us building up this lavish retirement fund. 
You know why? Because every time we do that, we have to keep building, building, and building. It's never going to be enough. But when we say, God, this is all yours and I'm going to give uh, lavishly, I'm going to give freely, I'm going to give generously so that you can do what you've called us to do as a church, but also so you can do what you want to do in this community, he is going to bless you beyond blessings because the blessing is to bless others. And here's something that we have to understand, church. We have to understand that when we aren't generous with whatever it is, I'm not even talking about just finances, I'm talking about uh, the stuff that we have. Maybe you're someone who has a truck and it, it could be lent out to someone to help move. And Dan does a great job. Every time I need something, I call Dan, he's like, you got my truck. And it helps fix my little fix of having a truck. So I don't have to make the payments. <laughs> no. Whatever we have, God has blessed you so that you can bless others. But here's what happens, church. When we become a church that just stores it inside, whether it's independently in our own lives or corporately as a body, if all we do is use our money for ourselves, God actually removes the blessing. He actually begins to take it to other groups of people that says, hey, this isn't ours, but we're going to use it to further your kingdom. And church, for us as a church, we may be small, but I believe God has called us to be mighty. We may not have all the money, but I believe that God's going to bless us exponentially because we're going to use it to further his kingdom. And I can't wait for that because when that happens, what else happens is that we have the assurance that God's going to meet every need. Contentment comes when we have the assurance that God is going to meet every need. Paul says, and my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. It's another, it's another question of you don't really believe that, do you, Pastor J.J.? Like, you don't know my monthly circumstance. You don't know how I live paycheck to paycheck. You actually believe that if we live generously, God's going to give back exponentially? You actually believe, Pastor JJ, that God's going to supply every need that I have when I'm already struggling? 100%. Amen. Because here's the thing, the church. Contentment comes from when we have the assurance. That's confidence. That's knowing without a shadow of doubt that God will meet our needs, not our wants. Paul says God will meet every need that you have. It doesn't say he'll meet every want that you have. I believe, church, that we have a lot of wants, but God is more worried about your needs than your wants. In their culture, man, the church of Philippi, you guys got to understand how much they gave to Paul. Like, it wasn't just this love offering. It was, Paul says, man, you have supplied every need and then some. You have given all that you could give, and, and then some. Truly, I'm thankful. And in their culture, what would happen in the Jewish culture is if, if Michaela gave to me generously, I was not really required, but because of that cultural connection, because of that friendship, I would give generously back to her. Maybe later that month, maybe the next week, whatever it may be, but it was a generous giving back and forth. But Paul knew that he couldn't give back to the church of Philippi. Paul was stuck in prison. He had to produce his own rent. He had to figure out how to eat every day. He was chained to a guard, so he knew that he couldn't give back to the church of Philippi. So Paul does one better and says, hey, guess what? It's not going to be me that's going to meet your needs. It's going to be my God who meets your needs. Needs. He is building them up in the face saying, hey, because you're giving lavishly, because you're giving generously, because you have all this stuff that you're doing for my sake, God is going to meet the needs that you have. Continue to give 
lavishly. Continue to be content with what you have. In church, for a church like Philippi that has poverty, what Paul is saying is that God will provide for their material needs. For a church that was facing present-day oppression, God would provide their steadfastness, their joy, and their encouragement. For a church that was advancing in their faith and in their unity, it was God who would supply the grace and the humility to reach that unity. For a church that struggled with grumbling and anxiety, God would be the one present to supply the peace that they were searching for. Paul said, it's my God that would do that. Not the God of wine. Not the God of, of, of him. Not the Egyptian God. Not the Roman emperor. Not the president of the United States. Not your governor in the Nebraska. It will be God that meets every need that you have. Because in their culture, there were gods everywhere. Everywhere you went, there was a God that represented something. And what Paul is saying is, hey, they will not provide your need, but my God, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the one who created you and knew you in your mother's womb, Jesus himself, the lamb that was slaughtered, is going to meet every need that you have in church. I got to tell you that it is not going to be your family member who's going to be able to meet every need that you have. It's not going to be the president that meets every need that you have. It's not going to be the governor. It's not going to be your teachers. It's not going to be your professors. Wherever you're at, it's not going to be them that meets every need you have. The only way that you're going to have every need, need met is through a relationship with Jesus Christ. And I want you to know that the need that you're thinking of right now is probably not the need that, that is really a need. The need that we have in a time such as this in 2021 church is this. We need joy. We need hope. We need peace. We need assurance. We need comfort. We need contentment. And that's what our God will provide for you when you lavishly give out. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. I just want to end with this. There's a church that was discussing potential board members, and this was said, and this is about contentment. Are we content? Do we have total peace today? This is what was said. A board member said, the trouble with him is that he's a thermometer, not a thermostat. This statement by one of his deacons aroused the pastor's curiosity for they were discussing possible board members. And Jim's name had come up. The board member said, Pastor, it's like this. A thermometer doesn't change anything around it. It just reg registers the temperature. It's always going up and down, but a thermostat regulates the surroundings and changes, changes them when they need to be changed. Jim's a thermometer. He lacks the power to change things. Instead, he allows them to change him. In church, I want us to know that the Apostle Paul was a thermostat. Apostle Paul was a thermostat. And instead of having spiritual ups and downs as the situations changed, he went right on steadily doing his work in serving Christ. In church, I got to be honest, that's what the city of Fremont needs. The city of Fremont doesn't need the Christians running around going up and down. The city of Fremont doesn't need a church that's constantly pointing the finger at their badness. What they need is a church, a group of people, a believer, to have the steadfastness of Christ that produced a contentment in them that when they look, just like that man in the Chicago Hare Airport, asks you the question, why are you at peace? My question today is, are you content? Are you content? Do the people around you know that you are faithful 
in Christ. Father, I pray, Lord God, that you search our hearts. Because the truth is, Lord God, that we can be content. Not because of what we do. Not because of who we are. But because of who you are and what you've done. I pray, Father God, that if there's some of us in here who are struggling with being content, if we're constantly pursuing the next best thing, Lord God, we correct us to realize that you are the best thing. We show us, Lord God, that there's nothing in this world, there's nothing in this life that will produce contentment like you will. And Father God, we pray a bold, courageous prayer, Lord God. We pray, Father God, to put us in circumstances and situations just like Paul so that we can learn the value of contentment. So that we can learn to be content in you and only you, Lord God. And I pray, Father God, that when that happens, Lord God, that we can trust you with everything. I pray, Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, will you show us in our own individual lives, Lord, to trust you in our giving. Lord, to trust you and know that you will supply every need that we have and that we can be generous with what you've blessed us with. And Father, I pray that when we do that, that you receive that as an act of worship, as you say you do. That we don't just go through the motions, but that we freely and cheerfully give back to you financially and materially, Lord God. And I pray that when we do that, Lord God, that as, as a board here at Full Life Church, that you give us divine wisdom and understanding how to use those funds to further your kingdom. How to use your funds to produce discipleship in this church so that we can grow closer to you. Father, we glorify you and you alone. For you are the reason that we are alive. For you brought us from death to life. And we thank you for that. Father, we're so thankful for you. Jesus, we're so thankful that you provided a way when there was no way. That you provide an example of what it's like to be content. I pray now, in Jesus' name, Father God, may your spirit reside in us to give us that contentment. To know that when we lay our head down at night, Lord God, that you have it all in your hands. That you're not surprised, that you're not shocked but that you're sitting up there just saying, I have it under control. We thank you, Jesus. We pray this in your name. And all God's people said, amen. amen.